is the uh, candidates forum for aspirants to the uh, Johnson Select Board for three and two years respectively. Uh, for the record, my name is David Williams. I'm moderator of Johnson Town Meeting. Um, and together with Brian's story, we're going to try to keep uh, folks in a rough order of a request to be heard. Um, under general ground rules, we've uh, the, uh, an email has been sent to the various candidates uh, listing four questions or areas which they may care to address, uh, obviously their name and how long they lived in Johnson, uh, what their primary occupation is, uh, what uh, special experiences or talents they have which are most relevant to uh, being on the select board and what they see as uh, Johnson's greatest opportunities and greatest challenges. Um, I will ask uh, people who wish to ask a question, or excuse me, the, the, I wish to ask the candidates, and I will recognize them in a few minutes, to limit themselves in their introduction of themselves to five minutes. Uh, all microphones, with exception of Brian's and mine, will be um, muted. Uh, you can uh, seek to be heard by putting a hand up. And uh, Brian and I will try to keep track, Brian, more than I actually, of you know, when the requests to be heard have come in so we can try to keep them in a rough order uh, of those who ask. Um, I'm told there's a slight delay in turning on microphones after you've been recognized. Uh, you then have to actually click on the uh, an icon to turn the microphone off. When you're finished, Brian will, excuse me, in order to turn it on. Uh, and then uh, when you're finished, uh, Brian will uh, cut that microphone off. We're not gonna have the chat feature on today so that we have one line of questioning and, and answering going rather than having one going. Uh, on this screen and then having another sidebar uh, going on, on the chat side. Um, <clears throat> the best questions that uh, can be asked are well thought out, briefly stated and inquire rather than inform. Best answers also are well considered, directed to the questions asked and are reasonably brief. Uh, that being said, um, our candidates are Duncan Hastings, <clears throat> Charlie Gallanter, Mark Woodward, Olga Marda Mardash de Klerk. Um, and uh, just to turn things around from the usual order of starting from the top, I'm going to start from the bottom of my, of my list and ask uh, Olga to introduce herself. Hi, so my name is Olga Maria Mardach Duclark. I'm actually fixing my name here. Um, I've been a resident of Johnson for over a year, but I've been living in Lamoille County since 2015. Um, and um, I'm a wife and a mom. I homeschool my kids. I'm a homeschool novice, a homesteading novice. Um, uh, we actually, um, really excited to be here in Johnson. Um, it's a wonderful place to raise kids. Uh, we've been visiting Vermont for many, many years, and it's always been a dream to raise our family here, which is uh, something that we're doing. Um, I am also a small business owner. I am a holistic medical practitioner. I'm an acupuncturist and an herbalist, have a master's in science, I was an EMT paramedic for many years and a community health educator. Um, so I have a bit of a unique perspective when it comes to um, being a business owner, a small business owner, being self-employed, um, and the, the challenges uh, that, um, that come with that. And the, the requirement to have an understanding of um, 
economics and what works for business, what doesn't work for business, what works for a household, uh, what makes things more difficult. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to get more involved locally. I've also been a grassroots organizer for over 20 years. Um, and I've, I've loved to volunteer um, and participate in civic things. So I'm hoping to bring that to, um, to Johnson to help it grow. Um, we're very happy that we landed here. And I'm just looking forward to continue participating in, in all the wonderful work that's already been taking place in our town. Is that it? I think so. Unless I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it open for more questions. <laughs> I, just, I just don't want to uh, cut you off if you had more to say. That's, all. that's it. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark? Okay. I'm Mark Woodward. I um, have lived in Johnson for 44 years. I actually came here, bought a place, and then realized that um, I had to graduate from college or I was going to have to pay my student loans. That was the deal my father made with me. So I, I went to Johnson State, graduated after I moved to Johnson, and that was in 1978. And since 78, I have... Um, I've done a lot of things in town here. I have a small farm up on o Overhill Road, and I've lived there. I was looking this morning. I think it's been 32 years I've been stacking wood in the basement there. And um, I'm also a small business owner. For many years, I had a small um, handyman construction service. I own rental property in the, in the village. And... Um, I think that gives me a very interesting perspective on um, the housing situation in our town and in Vermont right at the moment, and a real concern for how property tax taxes affect people in the town. And I think I, I looked, I think I've served a combined close to 40 years on the boards of nonprofits. I did a, quite a few years on Memorial Home Health. I did six years there, 11 years at um, Copley Hospital. I was on the board that Copley created to, that created the um, Federally Qualified Health Center in Morrisville, um, Community Health Services of Lamoille Valley. I helped create that, which is a really great organization that provides healthcare on a sliding scale to all people. And it actually does dental now. Um, I write presently, I serve on the board of directors of Vermont Electric Cooperative, which is a very desirable business to work at in Johnson. And um, if you remember the history of that, Johnson actually donated land in the village to, to have the co-op be headquartered here. And then it moved over to where it presently is. Um, but that, I, I work there and people know I've worked really hard there to um, trying to get broadband into our community, which I think is a critical thing for our future. <clears throat> I served as a justice of peace for, I don't know, six or eight years. I served in the legislature for 14 years. I did eight years. I took another eight years off and went back for six years. During that time, I um, worked very hard on education reform and was there to pass Act 60, which really benefited Johnson. Um, and a side note to that is I actually voted against Act 46, and I will most likely be voting to allow um, Johnson to secede from the district up here, um, because I think that that school is the heart of our community. Um, I also, in the legislature, and Duncan will remember this, um, worked hard to make sure that the state paid a payment to Johnson in lieu of taxes for NVU, and I don't know what the number is at the Last I looked, it was over 300 grand. And that is a, that's a big deal to Johnson. And um, I'm, well, you know, I, myself and Mike Dunham created that big sign and sat out there by the road last year um, with the Save NVU movement. <clears throat> and that's, as a graduate from there and as a citizen of Johnson, I know that that college is just really super critical. And I've done a lot of little volunteer things in town. It was Jen Burton and myself that um, created the community oven, which has the um, Monday night pizza, free pizza, which is a great thing. And that 
this weekend is to skate and bake cookie or um, a pile of other little things. I think um, Sharon Burns and I did uh, a millennial parade. So I've done a ton of things in the town here. I think that gives you a sense of my caring for the community and the future of Johnson. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, Charlie Gallanter. My name is Charlie Gallanter. <clears throat> I came to Johnson initially in my mother's womb. I now live in the house that my parents bought the summer before I was born. <clears throat> well, I didn't really grow up here. I spent every summer of my life working on the farm. And uh, in 1973, I bought the land that surrounded my father's house. So I've been paying taxes in Johnson for well nigh on 50 years. I came back after I retired, which was always my plan to come back here when I retired in 2012. I've been here ever since. <clears throat> my day job is I'm retired, as I just said. Um, I think the issues confronting Johnson or confronting the whole county, but frankly, the state. And I must have taken too many aspirin because I find myself in complete agreement with uh, Kate Donnelly. Critical issue facing Johnson and, and surrounding, well, the whole state. <clears throat> Fire, police, EMTs, and nurses. And the state has training facilities for firemen, the policemen. We have some colleges that graduate nurses, but then they leave the state. And we have no training program statewide for EMTs. And I hope I never need them, but when I need them, I want them there. Currently, we the, the town finances the police department the, through the sheriff, the fire department through the village fire department, and NEMS for emergency medical technicians. Currently, they weren't much, their rates didn't go up much, but I think in the future, we're going to be looking at substantial increases in the cost of those items. My unique qualifications to be on the select board. I could talk about I'm the only one that's a candidate that has decades of experience negotiating a collective bargaining agreement. So the town's employees have become unionized, and we're going to have to sit down and negotiate with them. My experience aside, whenever I negotiate, and I negotiate with both Matt and the management, we always hired an outside consultant to assist us. I think the town would be well served to do the same thing. Should I be elected, I would, I would suggest, well, even if I'm not elected, I would suggest that when the town sits down to negotiate with the union, that they hire a consultant to help them. In terms, well, that's, that's one of the unique qualifications I have. The, other, the most important, the most significant one is that I'm on the ballot by petition. I went out to individual voters and got them to sign my petition to run for the office that I'm seeking. It's significant because I believe in engagement with the community. I don't want to sit back and wait for them to contact me. I went out and talked to people, some of whom didn't agree with me, some who certainly did, and others that were undecided. But nonetheless, I was willing to engage in the conversation. I think that demonstrates my ability to at least listen to other people, even if I don't agree with them and they don't agree with me. So that's I'm now doing what I am. Okay. Um, Duncan? I take my mask off for the purpose of clarity. Um, Duncan Hastings, I've lived in town since 2012. Um, prior to that, I was the municipal administrator, started in, I think, 2002. So I'm pretty familiar with the community. Uh, my day job is uh, like Charles, I'm, I'm also retired. Um, I have been working as a consultant with uh, several other towns during that period of uh, retirement, um, assisting them with um, issues related to uh, small towns, small town governance. Um, I guess when I 
Unique qualifications would be um, primarily 25 years experience as a municipal administrator, 14 plus years in Johnson, um, the rest uh, with the town of Georgia, Vermont. Um, so I, I probably don't need to say a lot about that. I'm, you know, I'm intimately familiar with um, the processes uh, that the town is involved in, as well as a lot of projects. Um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, one of the questions was challenges slash opportunities. And in some ways, I think the challenges are, are almost the same as the opportunities. Um, Mark, Mark mentioned NVU, um, what most of us probably remember as Johnson State College. Um, Johnson State, uh, NVU is uh, absolutely critical um, to our community retaining, uh, strengthening um, it. Um, the, for the village alone, uh, it, it accounts for roughly 20, 20 plus percent of the revenue for water, sewer, and electric. If they were to go away, um, you know, the impact on the community just from a revenue standpoint um, in the in the village would be enormous. Um, and you know, it is it is a resource, and we're, we're probably going to have to think about um, how to how to save NBU in a different way. We're probably going to have to do some out of the box thinking about that. Um, so that's both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, the rail trail, uh, right through the heart of, of our community. Um, the entire rail trail is slated to be completed uh, by the end of this year. Um, that pretends, that, that portends a lot of uh, opportunities, I think, and, and we should try and position ourselves to take advantage of those opportunities as much as we can. Um, we own, uh, the town and the village together own 185 acres of land um, right next to the rail trail. Um, so I think there are some real recreational opportunities um, there because of the fact that we own that land. Um, we also own in land the Jewett parcel, which was uh, slated for industrial development. I believe it's really important that we make a final decision um, to either develop that park or decide what we're going to do with the property. Um, I think we have some huge opportunities right now with ARPA funding um, to make that happen. Um, that again is a, is a challenge as well as an opportunity. Um, so I think, you know, those are, those are just a few of the things that uh, I see out there as, as both challenges and opportunities uh, to our community that we will need to address as a community. Thank you all. Um, Ryan, I'm not, maybe, I'll, maybe I haven't hit the right button here, just a second. Okay, I now have my participant list. Uh, so someone who would like to be recognized and ask a question. So we do have a couple people attending in person. So how does it work is if anybody who's attending in person would like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and then I'll raise a hand online and we'll, we'll put you in order. But it looks like first we've got somebody uh, online. Recognize him, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Jessica, have you hit your mute off button? Yep, I've hit my mute off button. Um, so this is a, a question. Um, at one of the recent select board meetings, um, the select board voted to have a cannabis control commission. Um, last year, the town's people voted to accept retail cannabis. And so at the Cannabis Control Commission is a local body that will be regulating, doing oversight of the uh, cannabis licenses. Um, and the select board members are that commission. So what do you see as your role um, in as a commission member and also recognizing that Lamoille County 
Um, in the last 30 days, 27% of youth um, high schoolers have used cannabis. So what also is your role in working to prevent uh, youth misuse? Thank you. Yes, we'll, we'll go down back down the list uh, the other way. Duncan, do you have any wish to address that? Um, I'm not entirely clear what the question is. Can, can, that, can this question be restated? I'm sure it can. Jessica, is your... Yeah, um, so... I think, think we are good. Um, so, you know, as a Cannabis Control Commission member, um, what, how can you work to prevent our, our young residents um, from misuse? So uh, as you regulate the local markets or the local market in Johnson. Okay, Duncan, you wanna pick it up from there? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure how the commission uh, would prevent uh, abuse. Um, I, I suspect that the commission's primary purpose is to issue a license for the sale of canvas products, um, although I'm not... I, I confess I'm not entirely uh, knowledgeable on the, on the subject of what the actual roles and responsibilities are. But I have a strong suspicion that preventing the abuse of cannabis would be somewhat similar to preventing the use of alcohol and the role of the select board as, uh, uh, you know, in, in granting a liquor license. So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, Charlie? So, Duncan, I'm not sure exactly what the role will be, but in terms of youth use, misuse of, of cannabis in the states where it's been legalized, particularly Colorado, they found that uh, the only group, the only demographic that marijuana usage increased was the over 65 set. So I don't think whether it's legal or illegal affects the, the uh, affects youth misuse. So it's it, kind of a non-issue in that respect. Mark? Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I, I think where we're headed is um, where, where Duncan was talking. We're not gonna actually set an age limit or, or that kind of regulation on cannabis. We're gonna say where it can be sold. And I, God, it wasn't that long ago that there was, we had rules in the village that there was no alcohol sold in the village because it was too, you know, do you remember that? It was like we were too close to a church, or we were too close to a school. There was no alcohol sold in the village at all. And then the pizza place wanted to serve beer. I see that as more of our role is if the town, which the vote has already happened, is gonna allow the sale of cannabis, then, I think our role will be more location regulation in that way, not in not in prohibiting parents from buying it and letting their kids use it. That the select board isn't gonna. That's a state. That's a state law. Those are that's above our pay grade to be doing that kind of regulation. We're just gonna be more of yes, we're gonna allow it to be sold, and where are we gonna allow it to be sold? And clearly, the voters have already said they want it. So. Okay, uh, Olga. Hi, um, I'm actually really glad you asked this question. Um, as a, um, a healthcare provider, I'm an acupuncturist and an herbalist. I actually work with the uh, Vermont Cannabis Nurse Association. I'm an advocate for them. And I've been to the state house several times um, with the Marijuana Commission to kind of discuss some of the issues and concerns with the um, decriminalization, first of all, and legalization of cannabis in Vermont. I think it's, um, I think it's an understandable question and an important one as I'm also a parent. 
Um, so I am someone who does advocate for um, cannabis for adults um, and um, for medicinal use specifically because for people who have wanted to um, have access to cannabis, it's actually been difficult even through the medical program. So the decriminalization and passing of recreational cannabis actually opens um, for people who have not been able to access it through the medical program. But as a parent, it is concerning. So I just think one of the most important things to do is to destigmatize cannabis and to educate um, about cannabis. We do have some really good studies um, that we can, um, we can create conversations. Uh, we can create spaces where we have these conversations with young people and talk about um, from, from some of the clinical information that we have, which is that it is best to um, be experimental um, with, these, with this type of substance when you are a fully grown adult. And it's looking like the best that is for people who are age 26 and over. So I just think it's a matter of education, but I do think as a select board, um, this is a discussion that we can have in terms of what kind of spaces can we create for young people to have these conversations and for, and for parents who may have some concerns. Um, as someone who does support um, cannabis for adults, for medical and recreational, um, I also want it to be something that um, we have positive businesses um, and there, and I will say that as someone who has been active in this community, um, the cannabis growers and people who are getting involved in the, um, in the recreational sale are, um, on the local level. Like we have a lot of artisanal people. We have a lot of people who are coming from the herbal community who, um, are bringing it to a different perspective in terms of really being proud of um, local production and what it what it's going to be bringing to our economy. Um, but I just think it's a space where we can be creative and talk with, um, with town members and, and families and discuss like what support can we provide? Because I do think there is definitely a place for education. Uh, <clears throat> Josh, got any follow up? No? Okay. I see a head shaking, so I, I take that to be a no. Okay, um, another question. We do have one from the room. Uh, recently, within the last month, six weeks at least, the select board was asked to uh, add to the budget $5,000 for the Ted Alexander Center, $1,000 for the Johnson Arboretum, and to give 15 more minutes to the youth librarian to make her someone who could be eligible for benefits. And I don't recall how much that was going to add to the budget. And there were varying responses on all of that. How would each of you have answered that? Those three questions. Good folks at home hear that okay. I, I had a hard time hearing that. Okay. Uh, so I'll try and repeat and correct me if I get anything wrong. Okay. So uh, the question was uh, how would each of you have responded, responded to some recent budget increase request from public organizations? It was the Thousand dollars for the tree board for the, uh, for the arboretum. It was uh, the increase in hours for the youth librarian at the library. And what was the other one? Five thousand dollars for the Ted Alexander Wilkinson. Yeah, Five thousand dollars for the Ted Alexander Wilkinson. Okay, that's um. So we'll go back up uh, in reverse order. Olga, would you like to address that? Sure. So what I heard was um, the request for budget increase of $1,000 for the tree, but I didn't catch the last part because it's just like it comes in a little muffled through the, um, but, but, I, but I'm generally getting the idea. Um, increase in the budget for the youth librarian and then $5,000 I heard, was it the Welcome Center, is that correct? Yes, the Ted Alexander Welcome Center. 
TED Alexander Welcome Center. Um, in general, my take when it comes to um, budget increases is, um, you know, as the, as someone who has a household and someone who has a small business, it's always kind of looking at where we are specifically um, and um, where that money can come from without pulling it from the outside. So in this case, it would be um, without having to increase taxes or um, if it's a question of reshuffling certain certain things from other parts of the budget, making sure that that can be done equitably. Um, if not, I like to look at creative solutions. How I would vote with that, um, um, I would try to take an approach of kind of looking through everything and finding every possible way to do that without um, increasing the burden on taxpayers. Um, but as someone who I like to be a solutionary, um, I think there's many ways that um, we can be generous um, when it comes to certain things. So um, if we're able to look at that and if we have space in the budget to do that, um, then that's great. But if we're not, I think there's ways outside of that that we can be proactive in making sure that we can solve these problems. So if that's being creative and coming up with fundraisers or other ways that we can meet the needs um, that are met with that. Uh, that's how I would approach that to begin with. Okay. Mark? You know, my sense is, is that the Ted Alexander Welcome Center, um, I was there at that opening and that family donated tens of thousands of dollars for that. And um, I would I would be generally hopeful that we could find within our budget 5,000 bucks of one-time money. Because like Duncan had said earlier, I think the rail trail has the possibility to be a really interesting economic influence on this whole valley. From, I, I would envision that is kind of a gateway into the village in, to Johnson. And so I, I think that's a smart place to invest money um, down there. And that and the Arboretum are one time asks at this moment. So 6,000 bucks, I would look to see where we could find it in our budget. I do not know what health benefits for the children's librarian would cost. I assume it's family or whole family would get it. That's, that could very well be an ongoing $20,000 plus expense that I think we should um, look very closely at and see what the ask is and what that ongoing cost would be. And the town's role in supporting the library. Um, I'm a strong supporter of the library and I like, I like what they're doing a lot. I think it's critical to the village and the town. I don't know the answer to how much that will actually cost and is it ongoing for perpetuity. It has the potential to be a very large cost. So I can't answer that one way or the other. Uh, Charlie? Uh, I'll tackle the library first. I think the town needs to look at its, at its uh, employment policies in terms of benefits, pension, health insurance. Take a broad look at, at all of it. So the librarian the youth librarian would be part of that. I'm a strong supporter of libraries. That's education for the willing. People go to the libraries because they want to learn, not because they have to spend a period of time there. But the exact role of the youth librarian is, I don't know, the kids are where you start music, to learn to lose. Learn to use the library. In terms of the Ted Alexander Center, that's a that's kind of a tough one. It's very akin to what's going on with the industrial park where the people of, of the town were promised they wouldn't have to spend any money. It's the same thing with the, with the industrial center. People of the town were promised they wouldn't have to spend any money beyond the purchase price. Well, both of those turned out not to be true, that in order for the industrial park to be developed, we're gonna to have to spend taxpayer money if we choose to develop it. The Ted Alexander Welcome Center, I haven't seen it, but I understand it's they donated up to like $40,000. Is that close to correct? Yeah. 
And with the cost of materials suddenly going out of sight during the, the course of that project, I can understand the shortfall by about some dollars. Don't think it's too big an ask for the town to put in another five, roughly just a little over 10%, 12%. Uh, in terms of $1,000 for your arboretum, I don't understand the language. I see a sign for it. It's way off the beaten path, as far as I can tell. Um, I'm ambivalent about that. I like trees, but I pay for my own. So that's my answer on that. Okay. Um, a good question, but I, uh, this may be the answer to some questions that I get tonight. Um, I did not sit as a select board member through the budget process and did not hear um, the arguments for and against um, any of these proposals. So to ask me, um, you know, cold, how I would have voted on them is a little difficult because I'm, I'm not sure that I would have heard, you know, or did, I know I didn't hear all of the arguments that might have been made for and against um, those proposals. But generally speaking, um, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the Ted Alexander um, Welcome Center because I donated a fair amount of my own labor um, into that project. There was a very substantial contribution, um, an outright contribution by uh, the family. And my understanding is there's the potential for another fairly substantial um, donation. Um, so as I understand it, the $5,000 is to meet a potential shortfall um, in funding uh, on that. And, and I would be uh, fully supportive of that. I think it's one-time money. I think it's an investment in our future that may pay dividends in the future. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, as far as the library question is concerned, um, I'm a huge supporter of the library. I always have been, and I probably always will be. I remember finally going to libraries as a kid. Um, but libraries have changed considerably over the course of years. Um, and, you know, they've only become more expensive. Uh, I remember when I first started working for the town, I think the town uh, had a contribution of $10,000 uh, to fund the library. Um, it's, it's now a $100,000 um, operation or more. <clears throat> um, so I, I think I, I might have been inclined to want to put a question like that as a separate article um, and let the voters vote on it. And if the voters voted yes and supported it, then uh, I guess it would be built into the budget for future years. Um, the Arboretum, I, I'm going to feign uh, ignorance on. I, I honestly don't know what the $1,000 was for, and I don't think it would be appropriate for me to comment one way or the other whether that $1,000 is appropriate or not. Is there any uh, follow up question on that? Nothing. I'm busy being a poll. Can I say something? Uh, is it a follow up to that question or another question? Uh, it's a follow up to people's comments about the arboretum. Okay. Uh, what, hi, I'm Lauren Falcon. I live in Johnson. Um, I just want to say that the arboretum is a public space made for public enjoyment and recreation. Um, and it's run um, through the free labor of half a dozen individuals. So that's no cost to the town of Johnson. Um, it's also an explosion. So to expand it and make it more beautiful and enjoyable and to be an asset, a greater asset to people of Johnson and a greater attraction for people to come to Johnson and have fun and spend money, uh, it needs to expand. Um, and we need to invest in it to plant more trees and make it more beautiful so more people want to come and visit. Um, and I don't think the thousand dollars is too much I ask you to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Is that, uh, does that invite a response? Uh, 
Anybody have a response to that? Anyone care to? Um, well, I, I think my initial response was that it was one time money, a thousand bucks. I think we could find it. Okay. Kim, can I see her hand is up? Yeah. Hey, this is actually um, Scott Meyer, Kim's uh, spouse. And I have a three part question. And I'm looking for your thoughts on the village town merger. That's the first part. The second part is if we did merge, what are your thoughts on retaining the village electric um, program utility? And the third part is, and Charlie, I already heard you talk about this a little bit, but your thoughts on movement or selling the Jewett property to get that back on the tax roll. Thank you. Well, that's a fairly broad reach. Yep. Um, Duncan, I guess we'll start at the top of the list and go back down. Okay, so the first part of the question was thoughts on village town merger, Scott? Yeah, yes, yeah, so that was the first one. Okay, um, I might have a unique perspective on that, having worked for both the town and the village um, for, for 14 years. Um, having said that, it's, it's an incredibly complex issue, and I don't think there is a strong yes or no um, answer. Uh, as to whether or not it makes sense. I, I honestly think it uh, perhaps needs a bit more study. Um, there is a very formal statutory process that would need to be gone through in order to effectuate a town village merger involving Australian ballot votes by, by both entities, both the town and the village. Um, there would have to be basically a charter put together for a new entity for um, the citizens to, uh, to look at. Um, so the, the short answer is uh, there's, there's a lot of moving parts and I am honestly not sure what the best route to go is, whether it's full blown merger or whether it is some adjustment to the current status quo. Um, you know, my personal belief is, is it might be a stepped process. I will tell you that I honestly think that at some point in time, the village will cease to exist. You know, there, there will be a merger. When that is, I don't know. My initial thought was it wouldn't be in my lifetime. Um, but, I, but I think it's important for the town and village to think about it. I think it's important for a number of reasons, not the least of which it is going to happen, in my opinion. It's going to happen at some point in time. I think we would be well served to be prepared for that and have a well thought out plan for that. Um, your second question related to uh, what the impact of the electric department would be on that. Um, again, I think this presupposes um, a lot of necessary discussions about town and village merger, but my own opinion is I'm a strong believer in public power. Um, I honestly think that the village electric, electric department is too small to survive on its own. Uh, in perpetuity, in perpetuity, in perpetuity, per 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 <laughs> you think um, you say. Yeah, easy for me to say. Um, so I think we need to think out of the box on ways uh, to, to continue um, public power, um, you know, whether that is uh, um, a consortium of, uh, of utilities within Lamoille County uh, or what, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's an important part of the discussion um, and the utilities themselves are um, funded by rates. Um, so it, it really, um, you know, we really need to look at the fact that water, sewer, and electric are all um, user rate based, not property tax rate based. Um, so that you know that gives a, a different 
a different look to it. There are other communities, um, Stowe, Hardwick, um, there are other communities that have merged that do have public power utilities. They have done so successfully. Um, I see no reason why Johnson shouldn't be able to do that. As far as the Jewett property, I'm a strong believer that the Jewett property has the potential to provide significant economic benefit to the community. <clears throat> I, I don't agree that there was a promise made that no taxpayer funding would ever be used on that. If there was, I don't remember it. Um, Charlie may have a different perspective on that than I do. Um, but I do believe it's time to either, um, you know, get the ball moving on that or make a decision as to its disposition. Um, but I, I'm a strong believer and supporter that the Jewett property has great promise for economic development um, and increasing our tax base. All right. Uh, I probably wrote this down in the wrong order. So the Jewett property <clears throat> first. When it was proposed to the voters, there was a it was not disclosed that the infrastructure required for the property at that time would cost about a million dollars. That was not publicly disclosed at the town meeting where it was voted to buy the property. Whether it was promised that no tax money would be used or not, I believe it was, but I could be wrong. I've been wrong once or twice before. It's going to cost a lot of money to develop the Jewett property, some of which can come from grants, but grants require conditions and for the most part matching funds. So there will be a requirement for taxpayer money. Brian has a, a proposal on how to raise that money. My understanding is that the Jewett property, the cap, the property itself and interest will be paid off in the current, well, in the new budget. And so by the time I'm on the select board and voting on budgets. There won't be a property payment. So we could reserve that and continue to tax that money, collect that money through taxes, escrow it to make our matches on developing the Jewish property. My daughter made the change. I had said it's time to fish or cut bait in terms of the Jewish property. She made the change that to make a decision. Time to fish or cut bait. Um, in terms of the village mer village town merger, I was at the uh, joint select board trustee meeting, and one of the issues in favor of the merger is not really doesn't need a merger to accomplish, and that is the, the multi multitude of permitting. The village permits something. If you want to develop something in the village, you need to get a permit from the village for this portion. And the village trustees meet on whenever they meet. You need to get a permit from the select board and they meet on a different date. So it's a bit of a hassle. I don't remember the specifics, but if, like for instance, if you want to make a cone cut, well, the sidewalk is the village and the street is the town. So you'd have to go to two different governing bodies to get a decision. That could be handled by uh, an administrative entity that could handle that kind of problem. I'm not in favor of the merger in general because I, I, I think that there's a role for the, for the village to regulate development within the village. In principle, I oppose building codes, but I understand the need for form-based code within the village. And I opposed it as a town-wide measure. I wouldn't would not have opposed it had it been a village only measure. Uh, so I think that there's a role for the village to regulate things that only pertain to the village and not to the whole town. In terms of the village electric, I kind of have to agree with Duncan that uh, there's, a, there's a matter of scale. I realize that the village provides much better service to rich customers than the co-op provides outside of the village, right? You know, linemen are expensive and I'm not sure that, that the village electric can, can continue on its own. In terms of the other utilities, 
I think they're they're self sufficient through their own contribution or through their own rates. However, the all the utilities, I believe, even the coal or even the electric, the electric, the sewer, and the water, are very dependent on the state and and particularly what's now called Northern Vermont University and the payments they make. So. God, it's a toughie, but that's that's my thoughts on it so far. Mark? Okay. Um, I'll start with the village town merger. I am um, I tend to agree with Duncan that um sooner or later it will happen. I personally like small, I like small utilities, I like small businesses. I don't have a problem with village being small and village government. But I don't, I think at some time you're, you're, we are gonna see the electric department isn't going to be able to provide the services, keep the linemen, keep the utility going in a cost effective way. I, there's so many regulations I see sitting on the co-op board for renewable energy, for green power, for carbon free and um, as the customers of the Village Electric start asking for more solar, asking for behind the meter, I want my utility to be able to manage charging my cars. There, it's only a matter of time before there's a lot of electric cars in this village. And then you put that on top of what happens if NVU stops buying a lot of juice. Um, that is really gonna hurt the village. In, in you know as an entity in itself and for water sewer and electric the, that is our largest customer and um just a few days ago i was talking with the, i was down at the village garage talking to the employees down there apparently there's a clause in their union contract that says if the town and the village merge they get to opt out and get a year's salary at 75 percent or something it's quite a quite a big pill to swallow if they if the employees decide they don't want to um, continue working they get paid. So there's there's a lot to look at the details of a village town merger. I think it's inevitable that the utility <clears throat> will at some point not be able to provide the service that the customers are wanting. I mean, we still have a meter reader person that goes to your house and reads the meter. Those days are numbered. You know, I know at the co-op, they push a button and, and 40,000 meters are rent. So there's that kind of stuff that's gonna, they're gonna have to have smart meters, gonna have to be able to manage, manage usage behind the meter. Those things are coming. I wanna hang on to our utility till we can't. Um, same thing with the village and town merger. In theory, it makes sense. We've got two garages. We've got two managers all sitting in the same building. It's got to be more expensive than having it be under one entity. I think the people in the town, though, will be looking at a tax increase. The people in the village will be looking at a tax decrease. So I think, again, it's something that we, we get clarity and then we put it in front of the people as clear as possible and say, is this what you want, town people? Is this what you want, village people? I mean, I pay a hefty amount of taxes in both the town and the village. So I certainly understand that. The Jewett property, I don't have a dog in that fight. I favored buying it, the select board did. I thought it was probably a good idea. I think that in the end, um, we will benefit from it. I think it has lots of potential. They're not making a lot of, uh, commercial land on Route 15. It has access to village sewer, village water. I think the potential is there, even without us developing it, just having sewer and water. And I don't know if it has three-phase power there or not. I think it does. Um, it could. It could. It could. But those are all things that, if we put it on the market right today, I think we would um, come out ahead. Um, but still... I, I would need more details. Olga? Yeah. Olga, can you hear me? Yeah, I was just unmuting myself. 
Um, in terms of the merger, I'm when it comes to these types of decisions, I think it's important to understand um, what's the what's the goal, and um, also what are the causes. What's what's bringing this? What is bringing about? Um, and the the best thing I think would be to get um, as much input from residents um, and get a better understanding of what that means. Just from some of the issues that um, are being put forth, it really sounds like if the merger were to take place, it would, wouldn't be something that happens overnight. It would be a process um, and it would impact people in different ways. And I think it's important that um, we are as a select board that we're able to really understand like what is the short-term impact and what's the long-term impact and that we're able to make sure that residents, both village and town, really understand what that looks like moving forward. If that's a change in um, what taxes are going to look like, if that's a change in what specific services or utilities are going to look like, mm -hmm. that we really have that planned out. Um, as well as what are the options in terms of making sure that in the long run we can provide um, the utility requirements, because whatever happens in the future with the university, I, the reality is that what college looks like today is not what it's going to look like in 10 years. Brick and mortar um, schooling is really going through a transformation. So I think we have to kind of look at everything in that scale to understand what are the impacts going to be, especially if we're dependent on an entity for so much, um, like the college for so much of, um, for revenue and what that can mean in terms of the merger. I don't know enough about the property to make a comment on it, but I can say um, just as, as a resident and someone who, you know, who pays taxes and who wants to see the town moving forward in a direction where it's growing, um, I think there is a lot of potential here. Um, um, I would say my input would be to um, get as to get that clarity in terms of what is what are the long term goals and what will that look like? What would that look like? Whether there is a merger or there isn't, um, I think what the gentleman was saying. I'm sorry, I'm bad with remembering names. Um, that it's an eventuality probably makes a lot of sense. So I think what we would need to do is really understand that and make sure that um, we can look at what are all the steps that would need to be taken in the long run and making sure that everyone understands what that would look like. Uh, Scott, is there a follow-up on any of that? Sounds like not. Um, further question? Yes, Diana. Diana? I'm sorry if this question was discussed earlier, I wasn't able to join in right at six, but I wondered if you would please discuss your views on who you would represent while on the board. Would you be primarily representing yourself, you know, making decisions based on your own opinions? Would you be representing the people who voted for you? And how might you protect the interests of the people who didn't vote for you, who maybe had a minority view? Um, how would you acknowledge them? And most importantly, how would you deal with a situation where maybe your own personal stance, philosophy, or background um, seem to differ with what the majority of the voters were actually interested in having happen? Hey, uh, Olga, you want to pick up on that? Sorry, it takes a little bit to unmute. Um, thank you for that question. In terms of who I would represent, um, like I said earlier, I'm a, a wife and a mom, small business owner. Um, I've worked part time, you know, in different jobs. Um, throughout Lamoille County. And so I think in terms of that, um, 
And just a little bit of my background, I was born and raised in New York City, been coming up to Vermont for many years. So have different perspectives and different um, experiences relating to a lot of different people. My approach has always been to find the commonality um, and to find the compassion um, in the situation, particularly when um, people differ. Um, and it seems like there's so much, a little bit more divisiveness nowadays um, when it comes to politics. But I think it's really important to have the view to find and to really listen to what it is that other people are saying and what they're looking for in terms of a particular outcome or a perspective. Um, I can only represent um, myself in that sense, but I am always um, a listener and always someone, I don't have a particular agenda. I come to this um, really interested in participating um, civically and, and helping the town. Um, and so in that sense, I'm really open to what, um, what residents have to say and what their vision is and how to solve particular problems, how we can come together to figure that out. Um, in terms of dealing with um, a minority perspective or encountering something that may um, disagree with, with what I have a, a, politic, um, a particular philosophical perspective on, um, my view is always to try to really understand what the situation is or what the issue is and to listen and to find the commonality. I think if we're able to do that, we're actually um, able to find solutions in that way. That's something that I've always done, um, whether it's my work or in, in, in grassroots work or in advocacy work um, in the state house or in the past, um, because it's really important. And we are, we are always going to encounter people um, that have a differing view or, or, or really have um, a very specific way of understanding something or really want a particular outcome. And I think it's important to listen to all of those voices and to try to be creative in the solutions that we can find together. So that's how I would go about it. Thank you. Um, Mark? Um, that's a very good question. I appreciate it. I um, I don't know if other folks have been, um, I've been elected official. I served in the state house during some very contentious times, made some very hard, interesting votes over the course of my 14 years there. And um, I think what people don't, my takeaway from 14 years in the legislature is if you sit down and you gather enough information and facts and data, most of the votes that we took in the state house, 95% of them were unanimous because every committee worked really hard to try and get the good, good information, good data. And a lot of times decisions are, you know, you're making these 60, 40 votes in your, in yourself where you say, God, there's 40% of me that doesn't like doing this and there's 60% that does like doing this. And I think that that's kind of what the role of the select board will be is to get the best information we can and the best data and share it with the people in our town and, and help, help them come along with us and understand our thinking. Um, I've always, in my experience in Mount Pelier, tried to do what I thought was right for the communities that I represent. But I also tried, I understood that they elected me to get the information. They're not sitting down there full time. They're not sitting in this room full time. Our job is to get the data, to try and figure out what's the correct course of action and then share that with people. And when people, there'll be some things that people just will never agree on. But, 90% of what we can do here, we can do looking at good data and good facts and come together. If the select board is a 5-0 vote, then we need to be a unified front. I have been on many boards where I was in the minority and I lost votes, but I supported the board's position. I mean, just recently, I worked very hard at the co-op. I wanted us to get into broadband. I lost that vote. I support the board. I'll, if I get elected, I will lose votes, I'm sure. I will support the board position. 
but I will do my best to educate the, the people who voted for me and the people in our community to understand why we made this decision. Carly? <clears throat> One of the organizations I belong to has a unique way of looking at things and it's called substantial unanimity, where we try and reach a decision with at least a two thirds vote. A unique feature of this organization is that after the vote is taken and, and regardless of the outcome, the minority gets to speak last and make their point one more time. The majority of the winners, keep your mouth shut. It's up to the, it's up to the minority to express. And I have seen often votes changed on the basis of a, of a well-reasoned minority report. Uh, I don't, the select board doesn't work that way. <clears throat> but it's it's a it's, it's a lesson in collaborative decision making. When I was uh, <clears throat> chairing the uh, Johnson Spivernet Committee, couldn't ask for a more diverse board than what we had, but we were able to, for the most part, come to uh, consensus. Well, we did. We came to consensus decisions. I think our I think it was unanimous vote to dissolve the the committee at the end after we after we voted to form the to be part of the Royal Fiber Communications. It's like the old cigarette brand, L-F-C-U-D. Memorial Fiber Net Communications. Anyway, uh, I digress. And I think I pretty well dodged your question. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I had two apologies. <laughs> uh, very, very artful. Uh, yeah. Duncan? Uh, so it's been so long since the question was asked that I, I've almost lost track of it. But I think I think uh, I think Mark said some some good. Everybody said some good things. Um, at, at the end of the day, one cannot satisfy every voter's um, feelings or opinions. So at the end of the day, a vote needs to be taken. Um, and personally, I would do my best to listen to what people wanted and to make the decision that I thought was the best for the community, regardless of personal opinion or belief. Um, so in that, in that sense, I would do my best to represent the greater Johnson community, recognizing that yet, yeah, can't satisfy or make happy everybody all the time. So um, I agree with Mark um, that at the end of the day, you know, if you're elected, uh, they elect you partly to do the fact finding, to do, um, you know, to do the work that individual citizens cannot do all the time by themselves. So the select board is, you know, is that body that, that does that. My vote would be one vote out of five. Um, so, you know, I would, I would argue for a position, but as Mark said, at the end of the day, um, if the full board, you know, or, or if, the, if the rest of the board makes a decision, I think it's reasonable or appropriate for a board member to stand behind the decision of the board, regardless of personal feelings. So, I don't know if that answers the question. But. Diana, any follow-up? Taking that as not, uh, Jessica. So the, the town has a really unique opportunity right now with the ARPA fund coming in. Um, how would you, as a select board member, solicit voices of every portion of the population to really figure out how to best use those funds to benefit the town? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a final rule has been issued on how the ARPA funds can be spent. And miracle of miracles, um, the requirements are going to be uh, about as 
easy to comply with as the federal government could possibly make it. Um, my basic understanding is um, the town can say, or any town can say, they can use a threshold of $10 million as loss of income in whatever comes to the community and it's $300 per person um, for, for the ARPA fund. So um, one of the recommendations from Vermont Liga cities and towns is to use the ARPA funds to, to pay down budget expenses and thereby end up with a year end general fund surplus roughly equivalent to what your ARPA funds would be. Now, my understanding of um, general fund surpluses is that money doesn't belong to the select board, it belongs to the taxpayers, and therefore the taxpayers' authorization to spend the funds would be required. But again, I think it's incumbent on the board to come up with a plan and present it to the voters um, you know, to uh, as best as how to best spend those funds. As an individual board member, I would certainly be open to you know uh, individual community members' thoughts and ideas on how the money should be spent. But I don't know if that answers the question. All right. So it's a big chunk of money. And I think it, I think three hundred thousand dollars is is the right right number, and I believe that there's probably a million three hundred thousand dollars of ways to spend it that have been proposed. Jessica, you have my email. You can email me your suggestions at any time. Um, all the select board meetings are open to the public. They're well worn. So when the select board is making decisions on, you asked how we would get input. I believe that was the question, how we would get input. I'm available, um, you know, all citizens have the right to petition government. The agenda is announced. <clears throat> when it's going to be discussed, make your, make your uh, concerns known. And certainly you can contact select board members before they make it, before the meeting to uh, express your concern. I, I don't know how else to, uh, Get more input, Jessica. Mark? Interesting. Um, good question. It's a big pile of money. Um, it's, sit it's sitting in our lap. Generally, personally, when I get money, I like to think instead of getting a sugar high and paying something off or something, I like to think, what is the best way I can invest it this that will return money down the road. So are the so I would hope that the select board will look at that money and say, what can we do with three hundred thousand that will make a million dollars? What can we do with three hundred thousand that will make two million dollars? What that's that's what I would like like to hear from the voters. I would like the select board to work on versus buying new pickup trucks with it. Um, I just think that you take you know. If this money is actually that flexible, and I think where Duncan was heading was, you can use it in general fund. Then you have a sur then you have a surplus that is opened up to the voters can decide, or the select board can go to the voters and say, if we spend three hundred thousand dollars on this, it's going to make us two million dollars. Maybe we put it in the industrial park and sell the whole thing. I don't know, but that would be, I think, the role of the select board in the community. That's in that kind of discussion. Olga? Okay. Um, so I believe the question was, how would we solicit voices for the use of the funds? Um, I think something uh, because this is a very particular, um, very particular um, way that we'll be receiving funds for the town. I think it would be great to have kind of like a town hall meeting where people can come together and share uh, what their thoughts are. Um, and in terms of other ways where we can listen um, and gather some input from residents, 
Uh, I think Front Porch Forum is another actual wonderful way that town residents are sharing their ideas and their thoughts. Um, but um, once this comes in and, and you know it's discussed through the select board, I think it is really important to create that space where people can come in and share, whether it's they're sending emails, um, but I think initially it would be good to kind of put it out there to the community and say, the select board has this funds. Um, it could be used in X, Y, Z way. And we would like to hear and just share that in different venues. And we create a space, whether it's like a special town hall meeting where people can come and share, sharing it on front porch forum. Um, I'm not sure if the town, um, the town website has, you know, like emails of, of residents. I'm not sure how that works, but I think it is important to try to make sure that we are engaging um, the community. So an in-person or even like in-person hybrid with Zoom where people can chime in. Um, and I love Front Porch Forum. I think it's really one of the best ways that we have with, communi with communicating in a neighborhood, in a town. A lot of people have Front Porch Forum. Um, and it's one of the ways where we just, we share so much information. And especially when it comes to things on a civic level, there's a lot of interaction that tends to happen there. So those would be my recommendations, Jessica, in terms of ways to kind of figure out um, how to engage, because I think it is part um, of our responsibility as, um, as town members to kind of get involved and understand also like what, because the role of the select board is really important and there are specific budget issues, but it's important that everyone's on board with that. Any follow up on that? Any more questions? I'm not seeing any. Uh, if you're still on the telephone, it's uh, star nine to raise your hand by the telephone. Yeah. I'm standing down here. Uh, Kim has raised her hand, or possibly. Oh. Yes. Or Scott. Kim, Scott. It is Kim. And I'm just checking in to see, I might have missed it at the beginning, who is running for which seat? The uh, two year seat the contestants are Mark Woodward and no. Olga Mardash. No, you've got that backwards, Steve. I got it backwards? Yep. Three year. The three year. Mark and Olga are on the three year? Yes. Okay. I had it wrong. And mm -hmm. Duncan and Charlie for the two year. Thank you. Anything further? If, if there isn't, I would uh, go back up to the top of the list and see if uh, we go Duncan, Charlie, Mark, Olga in that order and they have any concluding remarks. Was that me first, David? Uh, Duncan, you won the prize. Okay. Um, I would I would offer one final comment, perhaps on the ARPA funding and the role of the of the select board. Um, I am completely in favor of you know getting getting input on how the funds uh, might be well best spent. But I also want to say that. Um, I think it's important to remember what the role of the select board is. Um, and it's, it's, it's not to be all things to all people all the time. Um, it's, it's a fairly well-defined um, uh, thing in state statute. And you know, I personally would want to be the kind of select board member that was not promising to be all things to all people at all times. 
So I think my responsibility as a select board member with regard to ARPA funding would certainly be to listen to anybody's um, thoughts on how they should be spent. But I think at the end of the day, um, a select board can't do what everybody wants them to do with the ARPA funds. So I think our responsibility ultimately is going to be to come up with a proposal um, that people can react to. Um, and again, if if the approach is taken to spend the funds as as part of the budget process and end up with a general fund surplus, I think it's critical that that everyone knows and understands that that money belongs to the taxpayers, not the select board. And anything that the select board would propose with regard to spending those ARPA funds in my opinion, would require approval of the town voters in some way, shape, or manner. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, I think it's incumbent upon the select board to come up with a proposal. I think it's incumbent on the voters to um, say yay or nay. Charlie? So, and Duncan hit it on the head, we're running for a position of leadership. And, and decision making, and we won't be right all the time. I believe that in leading through engagement, I've gone out and met with people and during my campaign, during my efforts to get on the ballot. I've, I have my opinions. They're not usually cast in concrete with a few exceptions. And I have been educated in the course of this campaign, both, uh, well, particularly by my family, to kind of tone things down a bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure yeah, I have to change the wording of that. I meet your family. You do. <laughs> I have a wonderful family. Blessed. So I believe in engagement with the public. And you, as, as I've said, people. I posted it on Front Porch Forum. If you want, if you have any questions for me, please ask and I'll respond. I believe the people that have asked questions, I have responded to, and they've thanked me for at least responding. I don't know if they appreciated what I had to say, but I was honest with them, and I'll be honest with the people. Any question you ask me, I'll try and be as honest as I can. Diane, I apologize for ducking your question, but I didn't know really how to answer that because we all have our own biases. And I I think that's one of the topics of discussion in town is, is our implicit biases that we don't even realize we have. I can't check those at the door necessarily. So I'll do, there'll be times that I'll have to make a decision based on what I truly believe is the right decision, whether I like it or not. I disagree with Mark that when a, when a decision is made that we disagree with that we have to go along with it anyway. This isn't the military. That was the way it was in the military when the decision was made. You know, you snapped to salute and I aye, sir. In public service, if you disagree, I think you owe it to your constituents to tell them that you disagree. Mark? Um, this has been fun. It's very interesting. I would like to say that, um, you know, in my 44 years here in Johnson, I was trying to think, I think I missed maybe two town meetings. Um, I've been very active in the town. I have, um, in my campaigns for the legislature, I went to every single house in Johnson. And I um, still believe in visiting with people and talking with people. Um, Front Porch Forum is lovely, but there's a lot of people that don't use it. And um, I would like to think that um, my 40 years of community service makes me qualified to do this job. And at bare minimum, people know my heart is in the place of really caring about Johnson. And um, in the end, I hope people would see to vote for me just by um, all that I've tried to do for, for Johnson. Okay, Olga? Um, well, just to reiterate, my name's Olga Maria. Um, 
my goals, I think, would be pretty straightforward in terms of communication, um, vision, and action. Um, communication is the most important component in building anything, whether it's a personal relationship or a small business a network. Um, and it's certainly, I think, really important in what we're doing on this level. Um, in terms of vision, I think that um, this has already been happening. Um, I think we have a wonderful town. I, and I think that more and more people are becoming active. Um, I think the hybridization of the meetings has actually facilitated that. And so in terms of um, coming forward and wanting to embrace um, the diversity of visions that we have um, in our community and, and represent those voices um, is something that, that I think is important. Um, An action. Um, and action isn't action blindly or action um, just for consensus sake, but I think action and understanding what is the, what are the overall goals um, and what are the things that will um, be of benefit um, when it comes to what the role of the select board is. So that's what I'm bringing. I think I'm bringing a unique voice and perspective um, and my eagerness to learn more and to contribute um, the best way that I can. Thank you. Uh, Brian, subject to you know, further remarks or formalities that uh, you might bring to my attention, uh, I personally would like to thank the candidates for their participation. Uh, I think it's important that uh, they make themselves available to the community in whichever ways they can. And this was a good one. Uh, and uh, I also am very appreciative of the people who signed in and commented and those who signed in and did not comment. Uh, and uh, I would suggest that all these folks go forward and talk to their neighbors and friends about what they heard uh, at this meeting and uh, just generally spread the word that uh, we're, uh, I think as a community, we're blessed to have four people who are willing to uh, uh, understand, you know, withstand the, the slings and arrows of uh, being on a select board uh, and uh, have offered themselves uh, for that service. So thank you all. Well, I think that's everything. Thanks, and let's reiterate. David, thank you to all the candidates for committing yourselves to public service and putting yourselves out there tonight and every day that you're running your campaign. And thank you to everybody else for attending and participating. Good night. Okay. <laughs>